So today I'm going to talk about deep learning approaches for MRI research and how it works. So this is going to be the outline of today's talk. We'll start with some of the applications of deep learning. What is the difference between conventional approaches and deep learning approaches? And then we'll look at the introduction of deep learning, some basic principles, what are the building blocks of deep learning? And then we'll dive into more specific application to MRI. And I'm going to talk about three of the application that we are working here at MBI, which is image analysis, image reconstruction, and motion correction. So let's get started. <clears throat> so first thing you should note that deep learning is everywhere. It is present. You may or may not be aware of the technology, but you are actually using deep learning in one or the other form. It is present on internet and clouds. Applications include such as image classification, speech recognition, language translation, sentiment analysis, and list goes on. Uh, one of the example of good example of image classification is Facebook. If you upload any photo nowadays on the Facebook, it can actually identify your face and automatically tax the images. And the underlying technology for that classification is deep learning. Similarly, speech recognition, for example, iPhone Siri or Amazon Alexa, Google, OK. All these are the examples of recurrent neural networks. They use recurrent neural networks to process the data. Similarly, we have a lot of application in medicine and biology, such as cancer cell detection, diabetic screening, and it can also help in drug discovery. You have applications in media and entertainment, security and defense, for example, face detection, video surveillance, satellite imagery. It is used in satellite imagery as well. For example, it can be used to detect icebergs and warn ships regarding their locations. And similarly, it has applications in autonomous driving, very critical applications such as pedestrian detection, lane detection, and recognizing traffic sign. So if you see all these applications, these applications are a class of applications which actually a human being can do trivially, but it's actually very difficult for a computer to perform these tasks. The reason for that is because how do we see the world is not the way the computer sees the world. If you go deep down into the architecture of the computers, you'll find that computers can perform only four operations, which is multiplication, addition, division, and subtraction. These are the four basic operations that computers do, but we perceive the image, we perceive the world differently. For example, we look for the features in the data. We can actually extract some feature and valuable information and can make decisions based on that information. And we want to actually replicate this same kind of methodology in the computers, which is called uh, deep learning. Now, although these applications are not new and people have attempted to solve these applications, based on conventional technique, which is called machine learning techniques. So machine learning techniques existed since 1960s. Machine learning is a way to solve the problem, prob these problems without actually explicitly programming any instructions. And deep learning can be considered as an advanced machine learning technique. So we're going to look in the differentiation between machine learning and deep learning in the later slides. So let, let's look at a conventional approach. So what problems do we have usually, or I would say task that we need to perform? For example, the inputs can be natural images or MR images, and your task is to actually classify those images, natural images, for example, into cats, dogs, aeroplanes. If you have MR images, you might want to classify those images into tumor cases, disease cases, white titer, hyperintensity, and all other cases. So in order to perform those tasks with conventional approach, what you need to do is you need to first use your expert knowledge. Because if you provide this raw data to the computers, they may not be able to understand. They will not be able to understand it. So someone have to use his expert knowledge to extract some features from the data, which is called feature extraction. That is hand engineering. The features can be edges, or transform, shift transform, or other kind of transform. Then you can use these features to actually train a machine learning algorithm, which can classify these features into different categories. And algorithms include like support factor machine, k-means clustering, and tree classifiers. 
so this is one of the example of hand engineered features so for example if you have face and you want to detect the location of the face in the image if you provide a raw image then computer will not be able to understand it so what you can use you can use your expert knowledge someone who has done a lot of work in this domain come up with this transform called hog transform which is histogram of oriented edges so if you take a hog transform of this um, this image it will look something like this now people have used millions of face images and created a template which looks something like this so this is a hog template face now if new image comes in you take a hog transform and look for the template so you can write a code to look for the template and finally you will be able to detect the faces so this is one of the example of hand engineering where you need an expert knowledge in the domain to solve these kind of problems now how de deep learning is different from the machine learning approaches so if you combine these two modules into a single module into a single learning algorithm it is this is called as deep learning so what deep learning does it is able to actually learn features extract features and make classifications and predictions based on those features so essentially if you look at one of the difference between deep learning this is one of the examples so here if you want to classify a, an image into different categories with the traditional approach someone have to use his expert knowledge and extract some of the features then you can use these features for the machine learning algorithms which will be able to classify these images but with deep learning actually this is a combined into a single entity so you have a convolutional neural network or other kind of neural network and you have a set of input and output images and then you train the network to actually extract the features as well as classify those features into different categories so this is the basic difference between so you can consider deep learning to be an extension of machine learning and what can we do with the deep learning so if you have a large amount of data one thing you can do you can learn and extract key features as we have seen in the previous slides another thing that you can do is actually you can learn a relationship between inputs and outputs so for example you have a set of inputs and outputs and you hypothesize that there is some underlying model which exists between the input and output and you are not able to find because it's mathematically difficult or it's highly nonlinear or for various other reasons if you are not able to find it analytically then you can actually use deep learning methods to find an underlying model an example could be this one you have an image so this is an undersampled image by a factor of 3 so instead of acquiring the data for 30 minutes we just acquire the data for 10 minutes if we acquire less amount of data then we get some artifact in the images so this is an artifact image with artifact and this is a clean image so we want to go from artifact image to clean image and we hypothesize that there is an underlying model which relates these two input and output so we can use the process of training to actually train a network and get this pretty images from artifact image artifact with artifact images now so up till now we have looked at uh, difference between the conventional approaches and deep learning approaches and we know that we can find the underlying model and extract some of the features from the images and text and other kind of data so let's see how actually deep learning works so the basic building block of deep learning is this which is an artificial neuron so this is an artificial neuron it consists of a set of inputs and a set of weights and what the artificial neuron does is it takes a linear combination of these inputs and it passes this summation to a thresholding function a thresholding function can be a simple thresholding function now if this output is greater than certain threshold you have the neurons activated otherwise the neurons is not activated so it actually mimics the biological neuron these inputs can be considered as an analogous to the synapses of a neuron and these weights are actually equivalent to the synaptic strength of a neuron and this neuron fires when there this summation is greater than certain threshold now we have this basic building block which is an artificial neuron we can arrange this artificial neuron in different configuration so this is one and we then we create an artificial neural network so this is one of the configuration which is fully connected network so you have so this is a layered architecture you have neurons with an input layer and an output layer and in between you have something called hidden layers and in this particular configuration 
each neuron is actually connected to all of the neurons in the preceding layer. So this kind of architecture can be used for various kind of predictions and classification. For example, if you have a brain image and you want to predict whether this brain image contains any pathology such as tumor. So the outputs can be either this image contains tumor or no tumor. So if the image contains tumor, the output for the network should be one. If the image doesn't contain any tumor, then the output should be zero. So this is our model. Now you start training the network, you insert the image. So the image first needs to be vectorized. So you provide a vectorized image to the network and you get some output. For example, if for instance, you get an output of 0.3. Now you know that this image doesn't contain any tumor. It should output actually zero. Now you calculate what is your error in the prediction. So the error in the prediction is 0.3. Now you can actually use this error and then you back propagate this error to adjust these connection weights. So these connection weights are actually the parameters which are learnable. So you try to learn these weights using the process of back propagation. So what you say intuitively, you say that, okay, point minus point 0.3 is my error. Now I need to change these weights in such a way such that this error goes to zero. So in this way, you try to minimize the error and in that process, your network actually learns to predict the right things. So when you have a new image, it will be correctly able to predict whether it's image has a tumor or no tumor. Another kind of architecture arrangement in which you can uh, arrange these neurons is called convolutional neural network and CNNs are actually the horsepower of deep learning. They are used frequently in various applications, mostly in images and even in text and speeches. So these are also similar to fully connected networks are layered architecture with multiple layer, but the arrangement is slightly different. So you have an input image and then you have a neuron which looks at certain part of the image. So you can see here, this is the red part. So one neuron will look into that part of the image and it extracts some of the information from that part. Now the same neuron will look at different parts of the image. So it's like a looking at different parts of the image. So this is called a convolution. So you have a convolutional kernel of certain size and then you move that convolutional kernel around the image. You get another image, which is called actually a feature map. So you have a feature map here. So in this particular example, you have eight feature maps. That means you have eight neurons, which looks at these images and creates eight features of size 128 cross 128. Further, you can do the same process again. Here you have 24 neurons, which are actually looking at all of these eight 128 cross 128 features and creating 24 more features. Then you have 36 features and finally you have a 256 feature vector. Once you have this feature vector, this can be used to predict a single value. For example, in the previous case, whether it's a tumor or not tumor, if it is a tumor, then the prediction should be one, otherwise that should be zero. The advantage of this compared to the previous one is that the number of parameters that we use is minimized because you have shared weights. We have only one neuron which is actually looking on different parts of the image, contrary to our previous example where for each pixel we have a lot of weights. But here actually the weights are shared. So we actually minimize the number of parameters in CNNs. And the basic operation that I was talking here is the convolution operation looking at different parts of the image. So this is a convolution operation. So for example, this is your input image and this is your new input to the neuron, which is like three cross three filter. It looks at different patches and you finally get an output. So this is a basic operation convolution, which is frequently used in signal processing and image processing. So input is already well defined and these convolutional kernels, these weights are something that actually you are trying to learn with the process of training. This is the convolution operation in action. So you have input image and this is the convolutional kernel. And finally, this is actually the feature maps. So you have many of these features map, feature maps and these weights, convolutional filters are something that you are trying to learn with the process of training. Now coming to some of the applications specific to MRI, the first application that I'm going to talk about is brain tumor segmentation. So for this application, we use something called encoder decoder CNN. So it consists of convolutional neural, neural network, which is used as encoder as well as decoder. 
So the input to this network will be four multimodality images, which is T1, T1 contrast enhanced, T2, T2 flare. And the output will be classification of each pixel in the image to either no tumor, tumor core, edema, or non-enhancing tumor. So we have four classes of tumor. So this is one of the representative networks that can be used. So you have four input images. These images will go through a series of convolution and downsampling operations, and you get into a feature space. If you just want to predict whether there is a tumor or no tumor, then you can use actually this feature maps directly here to predict yes or no. But if you want to predict actually the labels where the tumor is, then you have to use a decoder. The decoder actually upsamples this feature maps and finally creates an image, which is the segmented image. So this is one of the dummy example of the architecture of encoder and decoder. The exact architecture that we have used for this network is this residual encoder decoder network. So it consists of an encoder, which is a ResNet 50, which is one architecture in the deep learning methods. So this is used as a, an encoder and we have used a decoder. So in the encoder, it consists of a convolution and downsampling. And in the decoder, we have some upsampling layers, which actually upsamples the image. So initial image will be 256 cross 256. After this point, the image will be, say, 90, 16 cross 16. And you have to do some upsampling operation to make the image again to 256 cross 256. And in doing that process, actually, in doing encoding, you have lost some of the spatial information. So we reinsert the spatial information from the original data into the network. And finally, we predicted the outputs. So these are some of the result of image segmentation. So here GT means ground truth. So these are the labels which are segmented by the expert radio, radiologist. And these are some of the labels which are predicted by the trained network. So you can see here that it was able to predict it pretty accurately compared to the human expert. So this is one of the application. The second application is PET attenuation correction. So just to give you an idea of what the, this problem is. So what happens in the PET, you inject some radioactive material within the patient and the patient actually in response to that emits some radioactivity. Now this radioactivity is actually absorbed differently by the different types of tissues. For example, in bone, the attenuation is higher. For the tissue, it's low. For the air, it is extremely low. So in order to reconstruct the PET image, we need to have a precise knowledge of bone, air, and tissue within the space. So the problem that we are trying to solve here is accurate segmentation of MR images for bone, air, and tissue. Usually PET is used for this, used with the combination with CT imaging. CT is very good at identifying bone, but MR is not very good at identifying bone. So we want to use our deep learning network and train it to actually segment the MR images into bone, tissue, and air. So this is the problem we solved with this. And the network we used is exactly the same as the brain tumor segmentation method. Just the application is different. And these are some of the results. So here we have in the column A, it's a ground truth. B, C, and D are predicted from different techniques. So D is actually a deep learning based method. And B and C are two other methods, which is UTE segmentation and pseudo CT segmentation. So these are some segmentation results. And this is the error in the attenuation correction maps. So we can see here that the deep learning method performs much better than the conventional methods in here. So this is the one application where we have partially used deep learning in order to segment MR images. Now, another application that we are working on is image reconstruction from undersampled data. So what is the problem we have? because MR scanning takes a lot of time. If you want to reduce the scanning time, then one of the way to do that is you actually acquire less amount of data. But if you do acquire less amount of data, you get certain artifacts in the images. So if you acquire only one third of the required data, you get images which look something like this with a lot of artifact. Now we want to learn a model which can actually transform this image into a clean looking images like this. So this is become this becomes our data set. These are the inputs and these are the outputs. So what we did is we actually simulated images. So we have cleaned images and we have simulated artifact and then we train the network to actually 
find out the underlying model which relates this input and output. And the process that we have used and the network that we have used for this is still an encoder decoder network. So you have inputs and you have outputs. It consists of some convolution operation, down sampling operation, and then again, up sampling operation and finally image. Now, when we come to the final output part, there are actually two ways in which we can reconstruct images. One is we can minimize the mean squared loss. I mean to say mean squared loss is you directly predict the images itself or actually you can use a classification method whereby you don't directly predict the images, but actually you predict the probabilities of the pixel being of certain intensity. So that is called a pixel classification approach that we have used. So just to explain it, if we have input images, which is a scale between zero and one, and you have output images clean, which are also scaled between zero and one, they are floating point numbers. So there are infinite values between zero and one, infinite intensity values. Now we actually discretize this image and convert into an n bit quantized image. For n here, we used 8 bit. If you use 8 bit, then there will be 256 different values. So now each pixel will actually can assume only 256 different values, ranging from 0 to 255. So now what we can say, we can design another network. So this is the network, actual network that we have used, which is a UNet. So here we have an input image. And we have here 64 features of 256 cross 256. And we keep on doing downsampling, then go for an upsampling. In the final layers, we get actually 256 cross 256 image and 256 different features. Now there are two ways by which we can proceed from here. One is the regression approach where we used mean squared loss. So from these 256 feature maps, we predict a single feature, which is actually our output image. And another approach is a classification approach where we say, okay, this we have 256 feature map. And now, because we have discretized, discretized our image, I want to predict the probability of each pixel being in one of those 256 different classes. So this is the other approach, which is we, we call classification approach. So we have used this approach and these are some of the results. So in here, you can see this is a reference image, crown tooth, gold standard image without any downsampling. This is an image with a downsampling factor of three. So you can see various kinds of artifact in the images. And this is the reconstruction with one of the state of, of our technique, which is compressed sensing. And these are the reconstruction with deep learning classification approach. And this is the regression approach. So this is our proposed classification approach, which actually delineates the boundary quite efficiently compared to the other methods. And in terms of quantitative scores, it performs much better than the other methods. One of the other advantage of using the classification approach is noise immunity. So if you have noisy images, so this is your reference images. If you have noisy inputs, then these traditional method like compressed sensing is not able to perform very well and it severely degrades the image quality even with the deep learning approach and using regression network, you do see some effect of noise in the final images, but with the classification approach, you see very clean images. So this is another application of image reconstruction. This is the fourth application, which is motion artifact correction from MR images. So when the patient moves during the scan, you get various kinds of artifact in the images. So we want to use deep learning to actually correct for those motion artifacts. So what is the current state of art techniques that are used is instead of deep learning for the motion correction is this. So you have patient inside the scanner, you acquire the data, but while, while you are acquiring the data, you actually acquire the motion information as well. The motion information can be from an external camera, uh, an external field probe, or you have to change the sequence to acquire the motion information. So I call it a motion information module. So once the data is acquired, you can actually use this motion information and retrospectively correct for the degradations that are caused by the motion onto the data. And then you finally get your reconstructed image, which is artifact free. But if you want to use deep learning approach here, what we can do, we can combine these two modules into a single module which is a deep learning model. So if we use deep learning, then we actually don't need any external camera or any other modalities. We don't do not need to change any sequence. We can use deep learning module. 
Then our processing pipelines become this. You have patient, you just acquire the data. Once you have the images, you pass those images through a deep learning module and finally you get an artifact free image. In order to get this deep learning model, we have to use a process of training. So I'm going to explain what training did we use here. So we have reference images, which does not have any motion artifact. We can always simulate the motion on these images and we get images which has a motion. So these are simulated, not the real motion images, but the simulated images. Then we can provide these simulated images to a deep learning network. In response to that, the deep learning network predicts some output. Then we compare this output with the reference image and create an error map and back propagate this error to the network. So by doing this process for thousands of images with different motion parameters, you are actually able to capture the underlying motion model. So we trained it for the simulated images and these are some of the result of the simulation. So this you can see is an image artificially corrupted with simulation. This is the gold standard reference image and this is the corrected image. So you can see that a lot of blurring has been removed and even some of the features that are not really quite visible here are now visible here. And this is an error image. So we get approximately 1.78% error per pixel. Now these results were for the simulated motion. We have also tested it for the in vivo imaging. So the patient was in these scans asked to move during the scan. If patient moves during the scan, you get artifact which looks like this. Then these images are now processed through the trained deep learning network. And finally we get the images which is clean. This is another example here. You can see this image is quite severely distorted with the motion, but in here you have edges which are quite sharp. But in here you can see that there are no, not really very well visible edges. So these were the four applications specific to the MRI that we were working on and now going to some future prospects of deep learning and MRI. So obviously one of the application is automated image analysis in radiology. So if you look at the radiology, the MR images, getting the MR images is very easy. Once you do the scan, you get your MR images, but it takes a lot of time to get any information if there is any tumor or any pathology existed in the images. That is because there are quite less number of radiologists which who can actually analyze these images. So there is a lag between getting the images and getting the actual diagnosis of the disease because we don't have a lot of radiologists for analyzing all those images. So we can obviously use deep learning methods and automate that process. So examples can include the one we have discussed like tumor segmentation, tumor detection. You can use high, uh, white matter hyperintensity or hyper hyperintensity segmentation, image registration. You can use the deep learning methods to analyze multimodality images like MR and PET to get diagnostic information from the images. You can also classify the images into diseases like Alzheimer's disease, schizophrenia. And also uh, away from the brain, you can use it for different paths. For example, for cardiac imaging, you can calculate ejection fraction with these methods. Now, up till now we have talked about uh, images. We have not talked about any temporal data, but this deep learning method can also be used for the data where you have dependencies in time. For example, fMRI data where you have dependencies as time. So for those kind of application, the networks that we have used is called recurrent neural network, which are very good for analysis of the temporal data. So this is a brief description of how the recurrent neural network looks like. The basic building block for recurrent neural networks is also artificial neuron, but the arrangement is slightly different. So each neuron is actually connected to the input at that time point, as well as the input, as well as a hidden state which is coming from the previous time point. So at each point in the neuron, you actually have the information about the current time and the previous time. And these are very good algorithms for analyzing time series. And these have application in speech text applications. This can definitely be used for one of the application that I think is uh, functional connectivity through an unsupervised learning using recurrent neural network where you have correlations between different regions of the brain. 
so you can use recurrent neural network to find out the correlation and functional connectivity across different regions of the brain now the third thing that we should look into is actually incorporating the knowledge of neuroscience to this deep learning network so this is one of the analysis where it shows how do we perceive the world for example when when we see an image we get the signals directly to our visual primary visual cortex and we start processing the images with a center called v1 which which consists of a simple cells so what these simple cells do is they are called simple because they are just detecting edges they are they have smaller receptive fields and they are especially not not variant not especially invariant what does it mean that we have some neurons which are only activated when they see horizontal edges there are some neurons that are only activated then when they say a vertical edge so the neurons that neurons that are activated that are being activated for only for the horizontal edges will not respond to edges with other orientation that is why they are called the simple cells because they only respond to edges with particular orientation now this signals goes to a uh, center v2 which is composed of which is called complex cell so these at these centers what we do is actually we combine these simple features into a uh, complex feature and finally in the v4 we actually make a high level descriptor of all these features and finally decide okay what is the image whether it's a face or object so this is how the information is processed within the brain but if you look at the convolutional neural network and you look into the layers of the convolutional neural network you find something like this so if you look at initial layers of the cnn you find that they also actually detect some edges is simple features then you go to the mid level of the convolutional neural network you find that these features are now combined to make parts of the images now these parts of the images are further combined to make high level features where you can see full objects so for the object detection at high level features you have a full descriptor for the object and finally you are able, finally the network is able to classify it so even though the there is no enforcing of this particular methodology we have not enforced here that the first layer should only detect edges this has evolved through the process of training so there is a high correlation between how we see and how the network sees the world so we can actually use this kind of uh, neuroscience knowledge embed that knowledge into the networks to actually generate more reliable and trustworthy networks which thinks and processes information like what we process yeah so in summary i would like to say deep learning can perform automatic mr image analysis and shift through a large volume of images it can also help in reducing the scan time and correcting for various kind of artifacts it can be it has a potential to be used for fmri data analysis and also incorporating the knowledge of neuroscience will lead to a more reliable and trustworthy network which thinks like us so these are some of the acknowledgement i would like to acknowledge gary egan my supervisor jolin chan my collaborators john shah radiographers and mbi staff and students thank you oh okay do you have any questions um yes if you angela hi uh one question in the first application when you you show that you use different uh, different modalities of MR yeah are, are you mixing that information before going into the network somehow or are you using 3d networks or is just 2d uh, for the brain tumor segmentation are you asking or yeah, for the uh, tumor segmentation yeah. yeah yeah currently it was only a 2d network because of some of the memory limitations that we had but 3d would be more appropriate for it but even with the 2d network it was able to perform if you look at some of the images i can show you for example in here you see some false positives at this area that is caused because if it is a 2d network so it makes some false positives if it is it would have been 3d network that can detect correlations across the slices as well yeah so when you uh, when you feed the different modalities they are they all come you're not making distinctions between the different modalities they all go into the training 
Yeah, they are all going to the training. You have to do some sort of pre-processing, normalization of the inputs to make the look uh, nicer. Yeah, mm -hmm. they should have same statistics. Uh, and the memory limitation is why in the unit you have 256 by 256. Yeah. There is a down sampling in the images of the input. Those were the image sizes that we had, yeah. Ah, they are not 512 by 512? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we are working on 512 cross 512 also because when you go from 256 to 512, you have large requirement for the memory. For 2D, 512 cross 512 is okay. But for the 3D, it is not really possible with the amount of memory that we have. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Did you have a question? Uh, actually, my question uh, regards to your, I mean, application. I mean, uh, could I, uh, could you do like cell, cell tracking, or if, if if some cells is labeled with some magnetic particles or any other things, so could you track the the cell mobility inside? A, I mean, animal, I mean, model or like some cell-based therapeutics. I, we need to track the cells. Is I mean, is that possible with uh, MRI? Yeah, definitely that would be possible. But uh, when you say tracking, that means it has some temporal dimension as well. So I think the more suited network for that would be recurrent neural network. So you can use recurrent neural network to actually track some of the motion. If you have multiple images, I believe you have multiple images from uh, any modality, and then you have some feature which is actually moving across the images and you want to detect that. Is that the correct understanding? Yeah, and, and for that, we need to label the cells with some specific... Yeah, metabolism. for the training, you have to label it. Yeah, at least for the training. Oh, okay. Then after that, I... I'm, yeah, I'm once you to... have trained a sufficient number of manually, if you have a manually labeled data, so once the network is trained, then it can be used for the predictions. So that is why it is called like supervised learning. It is supervised, you train the network with some sort of label data. Unsupervised learning is there, but that is mostly used for image clustering. Like if you have, for example, you have uh, news, Google News, that classifies the data into different categories, politics or entertainment or other categories. So for those kind of applications where you want to cluster out, you can use unsupervised learning. But for making this kind of prediction, mostly you have to use supervised learning. So you should have some minimum amount of label data to train the network. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So in the next application, there is something called deep learning regression and classification. And you had SSIM scores. Yeah. How are you getting those scores? Like how are you validating those scores? Yeah, because these in this case, you also have a gold standard, which is a reference image. So you have a reference image and you have your reconstructed image. So you can always use these two images to calculate those scores. In the real case, where you don't have fully sampled images, then you cannot uh, calculate these scores. But for the validation purpose, how good is your network, you can always use the gold standard because these are simulated artifact, not the real artifact. But we have tested it for the real case also, but you don't have the ground truth, so you cannot quantify it. Yeah. OK, thanks. Are there any other questions? Yes. Um, I have a question regarding the, um, you know, a lot of our analysis work is uh, exploratory, where we don't really know the end. For example, we compare you know, a um, control group and uh, a disease group, where we want to try to find out some relationship in our normal um, analysis work. Um, I just want to um, to know if you can elaborate on how do you see deep learning networks can help part of that workflow and how deep learning fit into um, a sort of unsupervised deep learning network can be helpful in terms of uh, general analysis work we have been doing for years in uh, imaging. Yeah, so there are like, uh, even in the imaging you have the most of the work that we are doing is on the reconstruction and not really on the image analysis side. So I think for the pathology and all different cases, we have to, we need a time to validate because what are the results that we have now is for the cases where we don't have any pathology in the patient, but we have, but there are definitely papers who have 
done this analysis and they have found that these networks are able to perform as good as in the case of pathology. So, yeah. So I think that's, that there is a bit of, I would say, time which would be required to actually take these algorithms to actual practice because there is a still an ambiguity of they are learning algorithms so you don't really know actually what's happening inside it you can definitely analyze with looking at the features but in order to have a full trust on it it will need some time some time and maybe a large scale validation studies to properly analyze what are the pros and cons of these algorithms to really make it to the market yeah Do we have any other questions? Yes. Sure, I was under the impression that um, the new CRM networks require large amount of training data. So, in your case, how are you overcoming that limitation? Yeah, for the medical images, we usually do not have large amount of training data. But when we say large amount, we also have to consider what kind of application we are talking about. Usually, when we say millions of images. So that are mostly used for image net classification where you want to classify dogs and cats or other kind of objects. So what happens in that process is you have an image and you have a single output, whether it's a dog or a cat, right? So in that case, when you do back propagation, you have actually only one sample. For one image, you only do one back propagation. But in case of imaging, you have actually 256 cross 256 different pixels. And you, so those pixels can be considered as separate samples. So you actually, in, in basic terminology, you have a lot of data when you deal with the images and the application like image reconstruction, artifact correction. So in that way, we are able to do that. And we also have some sort of data augmentation involved. 